Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good to see you all in the house of God um, this morning. Well, we're going to turn to God's holy word. Shall we just pray? Lord, we thank you for your written word. We thank you because your word is truth. And Lord, this morning, as we come around your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit would speak into lives and interpret the word for us. I pray, Lord, that I will have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon me this morning, Lord. And I pray, O oh God, that as we proclaim your precious and holy word, that, Lord, you will do that work in each of our disposition that only you can do. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the Old Testament, to the book of the prophet Isaiah. Book of the prophet Isaiah and to chapter 7. And we'll read some verses together. Isaiah chapter 7. Today, of course, is the first Sunday of Advent, and um, we'll see where we go with our reading today. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fullest field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear, nor be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely he shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David. It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now if you know your Bible at all, 
you'll know that these words of that last verse that I have just read to you are quoted in Matthew's Gospel and chapter 1. In fact, they're found in verses 22 and 23 of that chapter when it said, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So here in Isaiah chapter 7, we have a prophecy concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus that was made over 700 years before he came. And it tells us at least two things about his coming. First, that his birth will be miraculous. He said, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, you know, that's been unheard of, hasn't it? In natural terms, that is impossible. But it was miraculous, friends. The coming of our Savior, behold, a virgin shall conceive. And the second thing that the text tells us is this. The nature of his person, who he is, which is found in his name or title that is given to the child, that she shall call his name Emmanuel. And of course, Emmanuel means God with us. Now, these words are very familiar to us at this time of year. But as we examine them, and as we study them this morning, they are truly remarkable. Perhaps you won't mind me saying that this week I've been wrestling again with this text because to try and come to a clear understanding of what it is saying, why he's saying it, and how I am to say to you what I believe the text is saying to us. And so, with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to share together some of the things that we've got from this passage. And I want to set it within its context, because that is very important. So our first heading this morning is the setting. Now we are going to be looking at the sign, but what is the setting? Because folks, if I can get that right, then I'm quite sure the rest will follow. Now as I say, these words preached, spoken by the prophet Isaiah, were probably... It's difficult to give a precise date, but around the year, perhaps 733 before Christ. 730 years, we'll say, before Christ. And what's going on here? Well, in the first part of the chapter, it tells us that these were days of threat for the kingdom of Judah. Two kings, we've read about them had joined together Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel to the north. And they've combined their forces to come and attack and to wage war against the southern kingdom of Judah. And they have a very clear mission. They've got a very clear goal, a very clear objective. And you'll find that in verse 6, because it says, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves. In other words, they wanted to tear down the defences of Judah. They wanted to tear it asunder. 
We'll make a gap in the wall for ourselves, it says, so that they're not able to resist us anymore. And what's more, we'll set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Now, we don't know anything about him, but if you like, we could call it a regime change because that's what their ambition was. We're going to go in, we're going to remove the current leadership, we're going to impose our own governors on the land. Regime change. Now, verse 2 tells us how King Ahaz and the whole nation of Judah respond to this threat. It was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. In other words, friends, they were absolutely terrified. And the Bible uses this analogy because it says the heart, his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. In other words, they were being absolutely swayed, absolutely shaken. They're being blown about. Terrible fear has taken hold of them and they are afraid. And this is the context of which this prophecy of the coming Messiah was spoken. It seems peculiar. It seems unusual. It seems a bit like a fish out of water. I mean, a glorious Wonderful prophecy concerning Emmanuel, Christ, coming in the world, and yet being spoken into that context. And it becomes even more astonishing when we think about the person to whom this prophecy is first given. Because by the time we get to verse 14, we find that the Lord is actually been speaking to the, uh, Isaiah has actually been speaking to the king, King Ahaz, king of Judah, as verse 1 tells us. In the days of Ahaz, son of the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now, who was Ahaz? What was he like? Well, let me give you a subheading under this setting. Because Ahaz was an ungodly king. If you go to the books of the Bible, Kings and Chronicles, they record the history of Israel and of Judah. And we find, for example, in second book of Chronicles and in chapter 28, the history of Ahaz. Let me just read you some verses. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father David has done. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made molded images for the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Sixteen years of absolute wickedness. Ahaz practiced idolatry. He began to copy the patterns of the pagan nations around them. And although Israel had the temple 
and this wonderful godly revelation of how to worship the true and living God, Ahaz rejected all of that. And he resulted and engaged in idol worship. Worse than that, if it can get worse than that, not only was he practicing idol worship, but he engaged in that brutal practice of child sacrifice. He was a wicked man. And under every green tree, on the hills, I'll tell you, friends, he was a wicked man into absolute idolatrous worship and rampant immorality. Right across the nation, it was rotten to the core. And it was all being encouraged by King Ahaz. It tells us, in fact, in Second Chronicles 28, that because of his wickedness, God had withdrawn from the nation. And prior to the passage in which our text comes in Isaiah 7, it must have been prior to this, he had already suffered serious losses. The nation had suffered serious losses in a battle against Israel and Syria that had happened already. And yet, God sends his prophet Isaiah to this ungodly king with words of encouragement and words of hope. It's most astonishing because the Lord, it says in verse 3 of Isaiah 7, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jasub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field and say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not be fear or be fainted. For these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Suri and the son of Remaliah. Now he goes on. And God was speaking through Isaiah about how these two enemies of his people were to be removed. In other words, the threat to Judah was going to be swept away. And King Ahaz, in all his wickedness, was even invited to put his trust in the Lord and to believe the words of the prophet, and he would be established. Because even at the end of verse 9, Isaiah said to him, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. In other words, if you did believe, you will be established. But if you won't believe, then you won't be established. So Ahaz, even in his deep wickedness, was being offered the choice then to trust and believe in the word of God and to be blessed and be preserved or to be unbelieving and ultimately see the kingdom fail and tragically, History tells us, and indeed the prophet tells Ahaz, what will happen. These two stubs of smoking firebrands will be removed. But a greater threat, if you read on, would arise because the king of Syria would come in later years and there would even be further devastation. And then beyond that, the king of Babylon would come and carry them away into captivity. But friends, this is the context, this is the setting in which this remarkable prophecy concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world is given. It's amazing. Don't you think it is amazing that God would stoop 
to speak such words of hope and comfort in a context of absolute wickedness to a king of ungodliness offering the opportunity for him to believe in what God was saying and to be delivered from his enemies. Now I see in that alone an application for us today. Because you know God comes even this morning and wants to speak into every one of our lives. God has come to address us in our sin and ungodliness, our rebellion and our pride, and he comes even this Christmas, this Advent, as the message is proclaimed in our hearing again, that God, soul of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The same choice, the same opportunity that was offered to King Ahaz is offered to us in the Christmas message to repent and to believe God's word and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved or to carry on in rebellion and unbelief and ultimately to perish in a Christless eternity in hell. How gracious is God that he comes to us today with this message. But we're still developing the setting here. We've said he's an ungodly king. But I also want you to notice the setting. It's in relation to an unnoticed child. I think if we get this right, we'll get it all right. Now, turning earlier in the chapter, Notice that as Isaiah went to meet with King Ahaz, in verse 3, he's told to take his son with him. Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son. Now, this is quite unusual because prophets were not usually sent on prophetic missions with their children. And it would seem that Shear Jashub, the son of Isaiah, is still very small. Probably still a babe in arms at this point. So why on earth would the prophet be sent to address King Ahaz with his own little boy in his arms? Why this? Well, friends, it's very significant because this child that Isaiah is holding helps to illustrate the prophecy that he's going to bring. Here is Isaiah. He's holding Shear Jashub, Jashub in his arms, I believe. But the weakness of the child stood in marked contrast to the great powers that were seen to be at work in the world at that time. You see, here was this threat. These two kings with massive forces. So that it made the heart of the people moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. There was an army north of the border. And Isaiah the prophet is carrying in his arms this weak and vulnerable child. And the message in the context is this, that no matter how vulnerable God's people seem to be, God will ultimately fulfill his purposes and they will be realized. You see, no matter how clever the schemes of man, notice, I mean, Isaiah was sent to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Why there? Well, it seemed to suggest that Ahaz was busy 
making preparations for what seems to be a siege that is coming. So he was plotting, he was scheming, he was doing his thing as the king, trying to put in place defences, preparing himself for that great matter that was before him because the battle was looming. And yet this weak child in Isaiah's arms illustrates the vulnerability of God's people. How are these prophecies of great blessings going to come to the world? You see, remember, God had prophesied way back through Abraham, the people of Israel and Judah. But how was God's purposes going to come to pass if those two kings that were against Judah, smoking firebrands, as the Bible calls them, how was it going to be fulfilled if God let them succeed in their ambition? But God had declared that he would sweep them away, but the weak will endure. And friends, were suddenly reminded in Bethlehem as we think about the babe lying in a manger, God's plan, because the weakness of the one whom God sends in poverty and obscurity as a baby, and yet through him, God is going to overthrow all the powers of darkness. This unnoticed child, the child of Isaiah, as he takes him with him, is named Sheer Jashub. And Sheer Jashub means a remnant will return. Which means evil forces may seem to succeed down the line. I mean, God's people down the line will be carried into captivity, but a remnant would return you see friends god even in the midst of the blackest of darkness and wickedness always has a people and god's promises will never fail but also in the setting i want us to see the age of this unnoticed child you see these two firebrands the king of syria the king of Israel are there, and Isaiah was there with his own child in his arms. And he goes on in this prophecy. And actually, in verse 16, he says, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now, I believe verse 16, because Isaiah, you know, it flits about from, from uh, talking from God and talking from the prophet and talking in human terms. But verse 16, I think the reference there is not to the child of verse 14, which the virgin shall conceive 700 years down the road. But it was this child that he was holding in his arms at that time. And he says, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. You see, before that child was going to grow up, in less than probably two years, those evil kings would be swept away. The thing that they feared so much would be removed. And the presence of Sheer Jashub, Isaiah's child, then enables Isaiah to speak of another child. So as he owned, has his own son in his arms, and all the significances I've just tried to fill out from that, there is another child with a mystery to it. Another child will be born. The Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, God's purposes would one day reach their ultimate climax. And everything that God had purposed would be fulfilled in Emmanuel, God with us. Friends, I'm glad that God has not changed his plan. From the moment that Adam and Eve fell into sin, God announced that the seed of the woman would come and bruise the serpent's head. And though some thousands of years elapsed between the first preaching of the gospel in Genesis chapter 3 and the final arrival of Messiah uh, in history, with all the ups and downs through all the prophets, through all the reiterating prophecy of Isaiah, God fulfilled his purpose. And Christ came to the earth for the first time. God's word cannot fail. And glorious friends, on this Advent Sunday, we can declare that Christ is coming again the second time. And he's coming to rule and to reign and to do away with every enemy of his. Oh, friends, let's believe this wonderful revelation of the Lord this morning. Friends, the babe in the manger became the man on the cross. And he came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Thank God for salvation this morning. But I needed to give you that background so that you fully understand the setting. Because when we think about the setting of yet God still promising the Messiah, it helps us to understand now the sign. You see, King Ahaz is invited by God to ask for a sign that what the prophet is saying will come to pass. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz refuses in his apparent unbelief. And he clothes it in the veil of not wanting to test the Lord. But you know, friends, that was hypocritical because he tested the Lord's patience all his life with his sinfulness and his child sacrifice and all the rest of it. And here the Lord asks him to ask for a sign, but still he's being rebellious. So God through Isaiah says, all right, I'll give you a sign. I'll show you what I will do. And that ushers in these words, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, this prophecy has been subjected to many attacks from many angles. Let me deal with two of the objections as we consider this sign. One of the objections is this. People say, huh, that's impossible. How can a virgin conceive a son? Impossible. Unbelief. And then some try to feed their unbelief into their interpretation of scripture. And they say, ah, well, you see, the word shouldn't be translated virgin. It should be translated young woman. So a young woman will conceive and bear a son. And sadly, even in some Bible translations, you find those words, a young woman. Now, I'm no expert on this, but there are experts that do tell us that the Hebrew word that is used in this instant truly does mean a virgin. 
And it seems beyond all shadow of doubt by the way in which the Greek translators of Old Testament Hebrew, and they, we have the Septuagint or the quotation in Matthew's Gospel, the Greek word also unquestionably means virgin. So let me get you right straight, friends. Isaiah didn't say, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. He said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive. And that's the whole point. How would it be a sign if it was just an ordinary woman falling pregnant? What's so astonishing about that? But for a virgin to conceive and bear a son, that requires divine intervention. That requires God at work. That truly is a sign. That's something miraculous. Now later in the prophecy of Isaiah, in chapter 38, the son of Ahaz is given a sign that he will be healed and he will be restored. And this was the sign that God was going to give him. He said, the shadow on the sundial will go back 10 degrees. The shadow on the sundial will go back 10 degrees. Now, friends, that's something that only God could do. Oh, I've heard people choke on these things and they say, oh, it's, it's impossible. Virgins can't conceive. Shadows on sundials can't go back 10 degrees. And they go on in their unbelief, Oh, well, you know, science is the answer to all things. But friends, what will they say when they stand before Almighty God? And he says to them, why didn't you believe what I said to you in my word? You see, friends, if we don't believe in miracles, we might as well shut our Bibles. We might as well shut the church doors and we might as well all go and do something else. Because other, we're wasting our time. But thank God this morning we believe in a God of miracles. In a God who intervenes in human history. In a God who intervenes in space. And God who intervenes in time. A God who does wonders. And that's why we're celebrating today. On Advent Sunday. God's intervention. God sending his son you see, friends, the virgin birth is absolutely vital for Christianity. It is not a peripheral doctrine that we can jettison because, friends, if, you do, if we can't accept the virgin birth, then the Christian gospel is blown apart. It's essential. It's fundamental. It was absolutely necessary for our Saviour to enter miraculously into the womb of the Virgin Mary because he is the Son of God. The doctrine is not up for negotiation because if you deny it, you destroy the gospel. And the second objection where people attack this prophecy, they say, well, it was given to Ahaz. So it was just something about his day in 730 BC or whatever. So how can it possibly be about Jesus? And they conclude it's irrelevant. Well, thank God, Scripture interprets Scripture. The Holy Spirit, when he speaks through his prophet Isaiah, spoke to us then through Matthew. And I've read those verses to you, haven't I, from Matthew's Gospel. You see, when we consider the setting and the sign, when we see in our mind's eye that Isaiah stood before King Ahaz with his baby in his arms, 
speaking of a child that will be born of a virgin, but also of the fact that before his own child grows up, before it's even three years old, before it knows to refuse evil and choose the good, the threat that King Ahaz faced would be swept away. And somehow there's a meshing of these two sons. Because the first son, in terms of order, Isaiah holding his child, he will not be three years old before the enemies are removed. And the fulfillment of that was seen in Isaiah's day. But the second child that he's talking about, the one that the virgin would conceive, would be down the halls of history from Isaiah's day. But he must certainly, he would certainly come. And just as the first child fulfilled in Ahaz's day, just so in the prophecy that threatens the nations today, Christ would come. And friends, Christ will come and deal with the kingdoms of darkness. Hallelujah. And the threat and security of the people of God. Christ will deal with it. And thank God through the finished work of Calvary, folks. The victory was won. And when Jesus comes again, he'll deal with all his foes. And his kingdom will reign forever and ever and ever. You see, this is how I believe we can believe these remarkable words of Isaiah chapter 7. You see, we've got the hindsight. We can see the whole thing unfolding. And we can see how when God said something would come to pass, it will be fulfilled. There's no excuse for unbelief. Ahaz still didn't believe, but we've no need not to believe. But thirdly, and very quickly, the significance of this sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew 1, 23. Let me just read it to you. Very famous verse. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, you could argue in a sense, well, God has always been with his people. Think of the words spoken to Jacob in Genesis 28. He was going on a journey, leaving the family, going away. And God comes to him in Genesis 28 and says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. So I'm sure we've all had many promises and read them scattered throughout the scripture where God promises to be with his people. But there's something more here, dear friends. Because the name Emmanuel means God with us. God himself with us. The carol got it right. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And you know, it's the presence of this child that brings God to us and ultimately us to God through Calvary. So you see, the one to be born in the virgin's womb came from heaven. You see, his conception and his birth was not the be beginning of his being. You know, when I was born, that was the beginning of my being. I was born at 12 noon, my mum used to tell me, just in time for your dinner. <laughs> but that was the beginning of me being but friends when christ came to earth through the virgin's womb he was the one who was already a being in fact he was from everlasting to everlasting 
and friends in that space of time in, in Mary's womb. God with us. No wonder Isaiah chapter 9 calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And friends, it's the same child as in Isaiah chapter 7. Oh, I tell you, friends, wonderful. I think it's Isaiah chapter 10. Where we read that a remnant would return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Emmanuel, God with us. Now Ahaz couldn't deliver himself from his threat. God was going to do something miraculous to remove two firebrands. But friends, let me tell you, ultimately, in the big scope of things, in the cosmic sense of things, God himself was coming into the world in order to break the powers of Satan, sin, hell, and death. This Advent, you're probably at the moment busy making your preparations for Christmas, Christmas shopping, getting the tree up, getting it decorated, cards to write, the turkey, the mince pies, whatever you're having and so on. But friends, let's make sure this Advent that we have the kind of faith that connects our souls only to his coming. To rededicate our lives to him. Because friends, he comes to you with this message. He said to Ahaz, if you will not believe, you will not be established. But friends, as we make our preparations, let's renew our desires afresh to believe and wholly serve the Lord Jesus. The carol wrote, oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Amen. And so we're going to sing about him right now. Our close